Hey, this is uh, patient RO. This is an otherwise healthy 36 year old female who presented with severe low back pain as well as left uh, foot and heel pain after a fall 10 to 15 feet off of a rocket. She was walking her dog at Wind and Sea Beach and she kind of like fell down the rocks. Uh, on her exam, uh, she had a fracture in her left foot. So she, uh, her motor exam was unable, unable to be accessed in terms of in terms of her tibial anterior gastrocnemius and EHL. Uh, however, she was uh, otherwise uh, found to be in, essentially intact. Uh, these are her, this is her CT scan. You can see that she has a, uh, a sacral fracture um, with some kyphosis. Uh, it's a U-type fracture. These are kind of the best cuts I can get of it. Unfortunately, they don't have um, cuts kind of in the plane of the sacrum. So you don't really have a good uh, CT cut that represents a, um, an outlet view, uh, which would be the most helpful in assessing the specific uh, morphology of the fracture, but it appears to be likely a U-type uh, fracture with uh, fractures through the sacral ala and then a transverse fracture uh, through the body between S1 and S2. Uh, it's about a 30, there's about 36 degrees of kyphosis uh, at the fracture site. You can see she has a uh, severely comminuted calcaneus fracture on the left side as well, um, associated with this fall. Um, so we're, we're kind of low on time, so I won't get too in depth um, in terms of next, in terms of trying to, you know, pull the audience. I'll just kind of go into my talk. Um, so the sacrum. Uh, just I'm just talking about sacral fractures and kind of their treatment uh, for a second. The sacrum essentially acts as a keystone uh, at the junction of the pelvis and the spinal column, and injuries in this area can compri can compromise the stability of the pelvic ring or the spinal pelvic junction or both. Um, this you can see on the image on the upper right um, of your screen uh, the kind of uh, keystone uh, concept of the sacrum. Uh, into the pelvis, and you can also see uh, the weight distribution between the axial skeleton and the hips uh, is largely transmitted through the sacroiliac joints. Um, so uh, the bottom right uh, it talks about is is basically showing that from an outlet perspective, the um, sacrum is a keystone. However, from an inlet perspective, it's a reverse keystone, and this is why you know, from our standpoint as spine surgeons looking at uh, spinal pelvic instability, we are largely focusing on uh, the bony aspects of the pelvis, whereas the trauma surgeons that are focusing on the pelvic ring stability are largely focusing on the ligamentous uh, aspects because they don't have as much inherent bony stability in the, out, in the pelvic ring outlet kind of image as you do in the, I'm mean, sorry, inlet type image as you do in the outlet type image where the sacrum is a true keystone. So uh, injuries in this area can result in severe debilitating deformity, chronic pain, and neurologic compromise. Uh, of note, the perineal structures are dual innervated by the left and right sacral plexuses. So their function can be preserved with unilateral uh, injury, even complete ligation of the sacral nerves on one side. Um, there's a, this is a 2017 study of 39 consecutive patients at a level one trauma center in South Korea that were diagnosed with spinal pelvic dissociation. Uh, about half of them were treated with surgery and half with conservative treatment. Uh, and basically they just looked at patients two years out and uh, looked at their mean SVA, pel uh, PI, and, uh, and outcome scores. And they found that the average SVA among all these patients was 5.4 centimeters. Um, and some patients were up to nine or 10 centimeters uh, of SVA two years out following these injuries. The mean PI was 77, uh, and this is compared to a mean uh, PI in normal volunteers of 46 to 53. So uh, presumably, although they don't have pre-op imaging of any of these patients, uh, presumably the average PI, uh, despite treatment, uh, increased by about 20 degrees. In the patients with an SVA greater than four centimeters, there were significantly poorer bodily pain scores and ODI scores at two years out. So this has a significant effect on patients. This is the image to the right is a patient um, out of Harborview that was uh, published basically showing that a patient with severe increase in uh, pelvic incidence from a uh, sacral fracture with kyphosis that ultimately needed 
two separate PSOs in order to uh, adequately correct their sagittal vertical axis. So you're seeing how debilitating and uh, this injury is to this patient and how risky of operation, the, the amount of risk they needed to take just in order to get them to stand up straight. So, um, you know, ignoring these types of injuries can have severe long-term um, uh, implications in terms of deformity, even when there's no neurologic compromise. So in terms of classifications, the first widely adopted classification was the Denis et al. In 1988, uh, this is an anatomic classification and divides the sacrum into three zones of injury, one, two, and three. Um, the idea of this was to uh, basically look at injury rates in terms of neurologic injury with zone three in the central canal being the worst and zone one in the, um, in the sacral ala being the least severe. Uh, interestingly, this was kind of before widespread adoption of CT scans and thus the large um, majority of fractures that they saw were in the zone three were transverse fractures. And that's why their published rates of neurologic injury were so high. Um, fractures that are vertical in this area have subsequently been shown to have very low uh, rates of neurologic injury. So it's the, it's the transverse fractures with kyph kyphosis of the uh, sacrum that result in neurologic injury in general. Then there's the descriptive classification, which is pretty widely used these days uh, in terms of uh, basically just how the fracture looks in the outlet view. Uh, and that's um, H, U, Y, and Lambda. You can see on the, the right of the screen, those sorts of fractures. I find that this classification is really easy in concept to understand, but in practice um, can be very difficult, largely because the CT cuts, um, the CT cuts that are done at most hospital systems are essentially inlet views of the pelvis. And so to truly get this type of view um, and have an understanding in this way, it's, it's very difficult. You have to kind of piece together a bunch of different puzzle pieces to truly understand what you're, what you're working with. The Roy Camille classification um, is looking at patients with transverse fractures uh, in compromise to the, um, the, uh, the, the um, overall sagittal balance of the sacrum. Um, so type one is just flexion of the, of the sacral fracture. Type two is flexion with posterior displacement of the upper posterior sacrum. Three is a translational injury where the um, upper part of the sacrum basically um, translates off of the lower part of the sacrum anteriorly. And number four, which was added later is a comminuted upper sacral fracture. Um, Types one and two were thought to be um, from patients falling and sustaining an axial load while in flexion. And type three was thought to be sustained by patients who fall and extend and ex experience an axial load and extension. Type four is basically thought to be if you fall and land on your feet in uh, neutral location. Um, of note, the Eisler classification is important because that can signify um, injuries which are unstable um, unilaterally. So if you have a vertical fracture on one side, if it extends medial to the L5 S1 facet, this could result in facet dislocations or instability, even in the absence of a transverse fracture, i.e. a U type or H type. So the AO recently tried to kind of put all these concepts together, as well as to um, create a classification that worked for both spine surgeons and trauma surgeons um, in order to kind of uh, create a more universal uh, understanding of these types of fractures. Um, this was based on the extent and type of instability, severity of neurologic injury, as well as the associated uh, injuries. Type A um, largely occurs below the sacral iliac joint and thus has no impact on spinal pelvic or pelvic ring stability. Generally, um, generally these can be treated without surgery. However, when surgery is necessary, secondary to severe displacement or neurologic injury, um, the, the surgeries tend, the recommended surgical interventions in the past have tended to include uh, plate fixation or, or uh, plus or minus decompression. And the reason that that is acceptable is because it's below the weight bearing um, aspect of the, of the spinal pelvic junction and thus plates are strong enough essentially to um, 
secure a fracture without, without compromising a patient's ability to weight bear. Type B are vertical fractures, um, which result in pelvic ring instability, but not spinal pelvic instability in general, as long as the um, fracture does not go medially to the L5-S1 joint. Type C fractures are the ones we worry about the most. These are the ones that result in spinal pelvic instability um, with or without pelvic ring instability. So these are our uh, U-type fractures, H-type fractures, et cetera. Also our B-type fractures that then go through the uh, L5-S1 facet and cause instability that way. Bilateral type B fractures um, can cause instability if they go all the way through the sacrum. Um, and then type C3 is the ones that we're most commonly consulted on, which are, are displaced high energy U-type and H-type fractures. So non-operative treatment is generally reserved for minimally displaced unilateral sacral fractures without neurologic deficit or in cases of stress and insufficiency fractures. In cases where there's significant displacement, particularly kyphotic deformity, uh, operative intervention is generally recommended. Our goals are typically neurologic decompression in cases where there's deficits, although this is pretty controversial. It's, it's never actually been shown in the literature to improve outcomes. Uh, realignment and stabilization and the prevent to the need to prevent prolonged recumbency and non-weight bearing. Um, reduction techniques have been described in, in detail, particularly at Harborview. Um, and these, these, these are well described, but they're not typically used in the community. Um, basically, uh, reduction maneuvers that have been used are uh, femoral distraction pins uh, between L5 and the ilium, um, uh, use of laminectomy, um, uh, sacral laminectomy, decompression, moving the nerve roots to the side, and then basically putting an instrument such as a cob or a laminar spreader into the anterior column of the sacrum in order to try to um, achieve a reduction that way. Um, other strategies that I think are useful uh, to be aware of um, when you're trying to obtain length um, in a closed manner include bifemoral traction, um, which, can, which can help uh, pull traction along the um, among the axis of the body and, and improve length, even in closed reduction maneuvers. Uh, this is a study, uh, this is a case report um, out of John Hopkins with uh, Dr. Kabash, who basically um, was looking at, was basically publishing the percutaneous kind of strategy for uh, fixing uh, pelvic injuries. Um, and basically is showing that, you know, you can do lumbosacral pelvic, uh, fixation percutaneously, which I think we all know. Uh, but this is the only, only really a uh, case report I could find on it in the, in the literature. Um, interestingly, he uses a uh, central incision in order to place his bilateral um, uh, S2AI screws. Um, you'll see that we, we chose a different option. So this is uh, what we did in surgery. Uh, we did percutaneous lumbopelvic fixation, uh, including L5-S1 and iliac bolts. Uh, this is the three of us in surgery on Saturday, enjoying ourselves. This is our final fixation uh, with pedicle screw instrumentation and iliac bolts. Um, I think it came together nicely. Our reduction was largely achieved uh, with positioning on the table as well as uh, reduction towers to the rods. Nice review, Dan. Thank you. And the case looks good. I thought it came together nicely. I think it, my understanding is that very few times it's really, these days it's really necessary to do a full open laminectomy and a, you know, really get in there with a cob and decompress it. But it's, I think it's useful to kind of have those techniques in mm -hmm. your back pocket for when when it really is needed. And then the extra stuff like bifemoral so, traction and- Yeah, that. no question. It's uh, it's such a profoundly impactful problem foundationally. If mm -hmm. it's uh, malaligned too, that you, you do wanna make some effort for that long-term benefit. What's the, uh, is the plan to pull the, the screws there at five one at some point just to allow the, that to continue moving or did you- the plan is that six months to pull everything. 
So yeah. we, we did it all perk without a fusion. 